And joining us now is David Wilson, the chair of the Ontario Securities Commission. Your first visit here to TVO with us, so thanks for coming in tonight. Pleasure to be here, Steve. Well, let's start simple. What do you do? Well, the Ontario Securities Commission has a statutory mandate uh, to protect investors uh, from fraudulent activity and to assure fair and efficient capital markets for investors. That's our statutory mandate, which is pretty self-explanatory, and we focus on that mandate and all the various things that we do. Sounds like these would be more complicated times than normal for people who do what you do. This is about as complicated as it ever gets. I think that's right. Who funds you? We're funded by the market participants, so we're not funded by the taxpayers of Ontario. We charge fees every year to market participants, the intermediaries out in the market that use the capital markets, and the issuers who raise capital in the capital markets. They pay us annual fees, and that funds our operation. But you're appointed by the Premier? Uh, appointed by the Cabinet, Lieutenant Governor, yeah. Okay. And you report to the government? I uh, report to Dwight Duncan, technically. I have a commission uh, of, of commissioners, 12 commissioners, and myself, another commissioner. So those are my immediate bosses, if you like, but my ultimate uh, reporting line is to Dwight Duncan. Okay. Let's talk about the state of the markets. We are facing, I don't have to tell you, one of the, well, it's the biggest financial crisis ever, probably. Uh, markets around the globe are suffering. Relatively speaking, how are our markets faring? Uh, our equity markets are getting... Uh, downward pressure just like the rest of the world, but in, in terms of the financial landscape in Canada, the financial institutions, the banks, the life companies, um, I, I think it's fair to say that the Canadian institutions are faring with much more stability uh, than anywhere else in the world. Recently, you probably know the World Economic Forum ranked the Canadian banking system the strongest on the planet. Is that because we're nice, boring Canadians, middle of the road and all that stuff? Well, there are lots of theories about why that is. Are Canadians more prudent? Is it the Scottish ancestry of thrift? Uh, is it better regulation? That's a possible theory. Um, there are a whole bunch of theories about why Canada's in such good, strong shape. But relatively speaking, and it's relative, uh, the Canadian system is quite strong right now. Now, I know your job is to prevent investors from being on the wrong end of fraud, but short of, say, out-and-out -out fraud, is there anything that you do to protect investors from what's happening right now? Well, we're not really, our mandate isn't to stabilize capital markets. Um, the, 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 the landscape right now and those that are looking at making it uh, as stable as it can be are the really four entities in, in addition to the OSC. One is the securities regulators, the OSC and the other provincial regulators. That's one group. Uh, the Bank of Canada, another very important player in what's happening now. OSFI, the bank insurance company regulator, very important player, and the Department of Finance in Ottawa. So those are the, the big four players. A fifth player that's quite important is the self-regulatory organization, IROC, which... Uh, what a great name. IROC? IROC, yeah, I know. <laughs> regulates all the dealers and the, and the registered brokers in Canada. So those five entities really are responsible for the various pieces of trying to make the system as stable as it can be. And we talk to each other all the time. You do. Lots of communication. Okay. Uh, I suspect people know more about the markets now than they did, say, six months ago. And one of the new things they've heard about is something called short selling, yeah. which, you know... Let's just say that the handy-dandy explanation is you're kind of betting on failure. You're, you're hoping stocks will go down and that's how you make your money. You guys on the 21st of September stopped short selling. And then you extended that ban until the 8th of October. Taking it off now. Yeah, Tell us we, why. we stopped short selling only on those, those on native stocks that are interlisted with the United States. Right. And so what we did was really a complementary response to what happened in the United States. The U.S put a short selling ban against uh, their FIs, U.S. FIs listed in the U.S. Financial, financial institutions. Financial institutions, sorry for the jargon. Uh, and we felt, we knew that we had to act in a complementary way because those same shares that are interlisted uh, between Canada and the U.S. markets were going to be affected by the U.S. rules. So it was a complementary ban that we put in place. The day after the SEC put their ban in place, we put ours in place. What was the and, effect of it? Well, we, we watched the markets very, very carefully. And on the Canadian stocks, the... Uh, the interlisted stocks that we put the ban on, um, we did not see any unusual activity during the period of the ban. We saw a little less volume, which is logical because those that would have shorted, which creates volume, weren't allowed to. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't see any unusual activity. And, uh, and after the ban has come off, it's, we're monitoring very carefully through IROC. Um, and they don't see any unusual shorting going on now either. But if the idea to put the ban on in the first place was to bring some kind of normalcy back to a situation because the I, I guess the idea was that with all the shorting going on it was further depressing markets which were already pretty depressed why why end the ban on shorting when the markets certainly have not settled down yet well it was really a US initiated ban and so as I say we we uh, we acted in alignment with the US the US had some severe problems with some of their financial institutions 
and they were concerned that what's called a bear raid was affecting the market price and creating a panic in those shares. Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley, all were alleging that there were bear raids on their shares. So the SEC acted, we acted in a complementary fashion in the same time frame. Okay. Let's do a little more uh, Economics 101 here. Certain sectors of our economy are represented in the Toronto Stock Exchange. And it's not even, obviously. It's weighted more or less from some sectors to others. Right. Can you help us understand which are more heavily weighted in there? Uh, the, the Canadian Stock Exchange is, and has been for quite a long time, heavily weighted in resources. So oil stocks the, are a big part of the, the market cap in, uh, in Canada. Financial institutions are a big part of the market cap in Canada, the big five banks. And big utilities like uh, BCE and TELUS are a big part of the market cap. So those, to give you a summary, Steve, I would say it's, it's resources, mining oil and gas mainly, uh, the big FIs, big financial institutions, and the big utilities. That's, that's the bulk of the market cap. There's lots of other companies. Mm -hmm. And who decides that the exchange ought to be weighted that way instead of another way? Uh, the market decides. It, whoever goes public and lists has a certain market cap, and the size of their market cap, the size of the value of their equity, determines the weights. Can you, or have you come to any conclusion about whether or not our exchange is actually appropriately weighted? I don't think there is an appropriate weighting. It's yeah. the, 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 uh, whatever the weights are, the mix of various industries that are in the index, that determines that those weights go into the, into the index and it fluctuates. On days when oil prices go down, the Toronto index is usually are down more than the rest of the world, usually because of the heavy weighting of, of uh, oil companies in our index. So could you, could you, if you want, I mean, if you wanted to, would you change the weight and could you do it if you wanted to? No, so it's, it's just who's listed and the size of the, and the value of the companies that are listed, that drives the weighting. Okay. What's your biggest challenge right now? Uh, I guess the, the biggest challenge is staying on top of things that we should be doing uh, in response to the crisis. And there's never a dull day, believe me. So you have to deal with the, uh, the, the uh, emergencies that come in the door, and you've got to take a more dispassionate view of the longer-term steps that you should take to protect the system in the medium to long term. So it's every day we've got to balance that. Do you get letters from members of the public who expect you to do more than you're actually supposed to do or allowed to do? We have a very active contact center. We have lots of letters come in, and uh, many of them are, are uh, very thoughtful and pointed letters that we can respond to and help or direct them to the right place. And some of them are um, not as knowledgeable as you'd like. They think there's a way to get their money back, and we're not the place where that happens. Although we direct them to places where they can get remedies for things like that, places like OPSI, the Ombudsperson for Financial Institutions. After the dot-com bubble burst, there was a lot of pressure on Canadian authorities, as you well remember at the time, to adro adopt stricter regulations. I don't think we did. Do we need... No, we did. Sure, the Sarbanes-Oxley in the States came in, the States, in yes. after the bubble. No, and, and Canada had a whole host of similar, not identical, right. but similar regulations. Um, a new uh, oversight body for the accountants was brought in in the States. We have one in Canada now. It's called CPAP. Uh, a whole host of new corporate governance rules were brought in in the States, and we brought those in in Canada, many of them similar to the Sarbanes-Oxley. Well, there was a lot of activity after the, uh, the bubble burst, uh, more triggered by, by WorldCom and Enron going down than the mm -hmm. bubble, but a lot of activity occurred after that uh, market uh, calamity. And as you look at the decisions that were made in those days to where we are today, how would you gauge the, gauge the wisdom or not of those decisions? Well. It's difficult to generalize. A lot of the decisions made in those days in response to WorldCom uh, World and Enron focused on getting the accounts correct, making sure the owners of businesses had an accurate snapshot of how their business was doing. We're not hearing about that this time. This is all about liquidity mm -hmm. uh, and exotic products like credit default swaps. So it's, you don't hear about the accounting that much this time. There has been some talk about fair value accounting, I know. Is our regulatory framework today adequate to deal with the kind of volatility you're seeing and the complexity you're seeing on today's markets? Well, as I said earlier, there's a lot of communication between the key regulatory players, the ones that I mentioned. Uh, could the framework be more efficient and better? Probably could be. As you may know, the Ontario government supports a common securities regulator for Canada, mm -hmm. and we support the government's view that that would be a more efficient, effective way to organize securities regulation. But in the meantime, with the structure we've got, we work very hard to communicate and stay in touch and share information. Well, you mentioned earlier there are those five pillars that are right. sort of organizing to try to you know, make some sense of what's going on right now. But in effect, you, you're, you're one of the pillars of the five, but there are lots of other provincial entities as well, right? Right. Um, can you explain for people why we have a system today that has 
you know, given how interconnected we are, why we have so many different regulators on the provincial scene rather than one national regulator? On for securities regulation? Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the simple answer is it goes back to 1867 and the, uh, the British North America Act divided up provincial and federal responsibilities. Um, the, as it evolved, uh, securities regulation fell with the provinces way back 100 years ago or so or whenever securities regulation started in this country. And uh, once the provinces have the mandate for doing a certain activity, they don't give it up easily. The federal government wants one national regulator, right? Yes, Minister Flaherty has been yeah. very clear on that. And you do? Our government has supports that. It's a political decision. It's yeah, not so up to me as a regulator. I understand. So if there seems to be so much support in the biggest government in the biggest province, why, uh, who's the stumbling block? There are other provinces that have a different view. <laughs> I gather so. <laughs> who's, the, who's the pain in the neck who won't go along well, with this? Well, the, the big four in securities regulation are Quebec, Ontario, BC, and Alberta. And uh, the, the idea of a common regulator has not been accepted in Quebec, Alberta, or BC yet. Why do you think that is? Quebec, I think we know. They're different. They're, they are a distinct society, different story. But what about the other two? Well, the other provinces have a vested interest in having a local influence on securities matters in their region. It's not surprising. Um, on a national, for, uh, for, for the national good, Mr. Flaherty and Mr. Duncan both believe it would be better if we had one. Hmm. Let's talk about the penalties that you can impose when people break the rules. What can you do? We can impose, and these are fairly new in the law, about three or four years ago, we can impose a penalty, a financial penalty of $1 million per offense for an offense under the Securities Act, uh, and that can be imposed by our tribunal. So that's the, the financial penalty. We can ban people from participating in the industry for life, ban them from being on public company boards. Those are the sanctions under the Securities Act. We have one clause in the Securities Act that allows us to go to the provincial court the criminal court uh, for breaches of the Securities Act and in those cases the, the court could decide the penalties of incarceration of five years less a day maximum. Have you ever had to do any of this yet? Well we've taken cases to the provincial court yeah and we've we've uh, we've had fines of a, a fine of a million dollars in the last 12 months at our administrative level yes. D do those penalties seem adequate to the task at hand? Well, the provincial court penalties of incarceration are pretty big penalties, um, and uh, the financial penalties are really uh, all that the, the government, the parliament that passed the law, thinks an administrative tribunal should be able to, to meet out in terms of, of penalties. We're, we're, not a, we're not a court of law, mm -hmm. we're an administrative tribunal, so there's a, a limit on, on what's fair for a tribunal to, to be able to hand out in the way of penalties. But one wonders, if, you, if you're a multi-billion dollar organization, a fine of a million dollars may not seem all that impressive if you've done something wrong. No, but if you're the CEO and you're banned for life from being a director of a public company or if you're an intermediary and you're banned from life from earning a living in that business, those are pretty severe penalties. Hmm. Uh, my hunch is that the public thinks of the stock market today as a bit like the Wild West. It's totally unpredictable and out of control. And I, I, you know, I just wonder from a personal standpoint how you kind of go into work every day and deal with the unreality of everything that's going on right now. Well, we've got to put it in perspective, Steve. The, the stock market in the last six months has been like the Wild West and very upsetting for people that are losing values in their RSPs and so on. Uh, but we shouldn't forget we've had a very long period of quite good stock performance and people have done very well buying a good diversified pro portfolio of equity. So short-term reactions shouldn't create a lasting impression of a long-standing institution for savings and value creation. And in our last 30 seconds, Mr. Chairman, I know all of our viewers would be interested to know what stocks you're recommending that we purchase. So go ahead, look right into that camera and tell us. It's not part of my mandate, Steve, but <laughs> thanks for asking. Why did I think you were going to say that? <laughs> not a shock. Okay, David Wilson, good of you to come in tonight and uh, help us understand uh, some of the Wild West on our markets these days. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Steve. Okay.